Thanks for tuning in to the Women's Vibrancy Code, a podcast dedicated to helping women move from exhausted to energized, balance their hormones, and feeling turned on by their life, their lover, and themselves. I'm your host, Mariah Brown. I'm a Yale and functional medicine trained women's health expert, midwife, mom, keynote speaker, and self-made entrepreneur. I'm the founder of my signature program, the Women's Vibrancy Code. So sit back relax, and let's chat about your energy, hormones, libido, and embracing your feminine power. Oh, and you might want to have pen and paper to take some notes on some of these episodes. Hey, everybody, let's talk about mold. This is going to be an exciting conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. Oh, take a breath. So, uh, I, we, Chris, how long have we been talking about doing this interview? A long time. A, a long, long time. Time. You know, it's fascinating as a woman's health provider. I feel like there's often moments over years and years where I'll be interacting with a patient or a client, and I feel like, man, there's all these symptoms. And I'm just curious, could this be mold? And it feels, for me, it still feels quite complicated. And it seems like the symptoms can be so broad. So everyone, we're going to talk today about what are some of the symptoms that can show up if you've been exposed to mold, if there's mold in your home, as well as what questions do you ask your provider? How do you find a provider? What tests can be done in your body? What tests can be done in your home? all that stuff. Um, and Chris and I don't have any pre-planned questions, so we're just going to roll with it. <laughs> He's like, I don't know. You just can ask me anything. And so let me tell you a little bit about Chris. Um, he is a homeopath and chiropractor and a naturopath. I already learned something new. You're all three. Mm -hmm. Yes. That's, like, that's amazing. So it's Dr. Chris Lebowski. He also lives here in Ashland, Oregon, where I am, and his son and my daughter have been in school together, I think, like since they were four, I think. Long time. A yeah. long time. And they're currently um, in Hebrew school together right now, too. And Chris and I have had time together in person. And he's just, I got to tell you, he's a really good, good guy, great provider. I remember even before I went online, we even explored the possibility of me coming in and doing some women's health for the practice. So we did. We've, we've woven together in all different ways. So let me read his bio and then let's get the show on the road. Dr. Chris Lebowski, like I said, is a naturopath, chiropractor, clinical herbalist, and homeopath. At his clinic, Ashland Natural Medicine in Southern Oregon, Dr. Lebowski and his staff use cutting edge technology blended with traditional therapies. He specializes in helping patients recover from chronic Lyme disease, mold illness, cancer, neurological disorders, and most commonly, quote unquote, mystery diseases that other doctors have been unable to diagnose. Dr. Lebowski lectures regularly on the root causes of illness, and his articles have appeared in Naturopathic Doctor News and Review, Townsend Letter, and Simil, what is that one? Similimum. Okay, <laughs> which is what? It's a hard word to pronounce. <laughs> It's a term from homeopathy, but that's a, a homeopathic journal. Okay. I wasn't even going to try. Okay. Sure. He holds medical degrees with Western States Chiropractic College and the National College of Natural Medicine. And his latest endeavor is a compelling new book about how to safely navigate the unfortunate eventuality of future pandemics, as well as a natural medicine response to C-19, published by Chelsea Green, The Virus and the Host. It will arrive on bookshelves September. Oh, it's already arrived. So September 2022, it launched. And I have two websites down below in the description, which are both his website as well as the site for his book. The last thing is when he isn't working on a difficult case, peering into his microscope or spending time with his wife and their two children, you can find Dr. Lebowski climbing up the rocks or skiing down the mountains of Southern Oregon and Northern California. The other side note is my family is crazy enough to have put down a deposit on a puppy. <laughs> 
And and it's one of my dogs puppies yes yeah. so we are gonna we're now we're bonded related. in blood too <laughs> yeah we are okay cool. so let's get you the show on the road anything else you would like to add up front regarding um success look like for you in regard to all the things that we can talk about today in the with the broad it's, stroke of mold sure what I would love for today is that people to have a better grasp about when the bells should go off in their head this might be mold, whether they're a practitioner or they're per someone that's been sick for a long time. And I hope to sort of tease apart and unweave some of the, what is really complexity around mold and yeah. the pervasiveness of it. And that would be yeah. the last thing is that I really like people to recognize that mold illness is so incredibly common mm -hmm. and it is so incredibly commonly missed. Yeah. Um, it still feels pretty obscure to me, and I'm looking forward to learning myself. Hey, right off the bat, do you work online? So, you know, my audience is all over the world. If there's a woman or anyone who's listening to this and they don't live in Southern Oregon, just right off the bat, do you do any online work? Sure. We have patients all over the world. Okay. We see all them right. on an online telehealth platform or over the telephone. My preference is to sit across from people. I like to have them in my office. I like to look at their blood under microscope. I like to look at their tongues, but we certainly help people all over the world. Okay. So um, hopefully that whoever is listening gives you another reason to really perk up and listen. Okay. So let's start with what are some of the symptoms? <laughs> if someone has been exposed to mold, has mold within their bodies, what are some of the things that they'll come into you with a laundry list and you're going, yep, check that, check that. You're thinking mold. Sure. Well, one, anyone that's been sick for a very long time, that immediately makes me think of mold. Not that that's the only reason, but that's one of the things that your ears should perk up. Two, someone that has seen lots of other doctors and still isn't well, that should give someone a clue too. You know, particularly lots of functional medicine doctors, lots of nature paths, lots of people that sort of think outside the box. If yeah. someone's seen a lot of those people and they're still not well, that makes me think about mold. Anyone that comes in in the broadest sense with deep fatigue, muscle pain, joint pain, things that sound like classically like fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, those should always tip us off that there might be mold. Mm -hmm. People that come in with a longstanding diagnosis of Lyme disease that have seen practitioners, been treated for Lyme and not gotten well, that's a big tip off to mold. Hmm. Then if you go through the body, the, the thing with mold is that it can cause so many varied symptoms and so many different systems of the body that you can pretty much go through every system and find symptoms. You know, in the head, you can have headaches. In the eyes, you can have irritation and dryness. In the upper respiratory tract, there can be chronic sinusitis, chronic post-nasal drip, chronic sinus pain, chronic cough and chest congestion, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, frequent urination, bladder pain, muscular pain, joint pain, skin eruption. So you can start to see that it can show up in any system of the body. So it's really kind of that first block of stuff where you go like, well, why, why does this person, why have they been sick for 20 years? Why have they been treated for all these things and they're not well? And it really goes back to the fact that, you know, mold is starting to become recognized as a big health problem. Even 20 years ago, 15 years ago, doctors of naturopathy, practitioners of functional medicine, they just weren't really looking for it. And so now everyone's eyes are on it and we're starting to see, wow, that person I was treating 10 years ago with chronic fatigue they had mold. Wow, that person that I thought it was just Lyme, it was mold. So thankfully, it's starting to come into people's awareness. Mm -hmm. I also think brain fog. Absolutely. That's cognitive probably. issues. You betcha. Yeah. Um, what about autoimmune conditions? So if someone's been diagnosed with Hashimoto's or chronic hives, rashes, um, allergies. Do, is any of that in the world of mold? Sure. So the skin stuff, absolutely. Someone that's getting hives, someone that's having urticaria, someone that's have itching skin, eruptions, often think of mold. And I can tell you some great stories there. 
The autoimmune piece, absolutely. So when we start to see that the immune system is attacking self tissues, and I don't believe that that happens for no reason. I don't believe there's a single case of autoimmunity on the planet where the immune system just said, hey, I'm going to attack this person's thyroid for no good reason. Yeah. I think that's baloney, and I think it's simplistic, and I think it does not in any way bow down to the wonderful intelligence of the human body. Yep. The human body starts to attack its own tissues when there's something in there that it doesn't like. So right. if you have mold in the wall of your intestines, you might go on to develop you know, some sort of autoimmune bowel. If like you have mold, or, or exactly. Yeah. Yep. So if you have mold lodged in your sinuses, you might start to get antibodies against your mucosa. Mm -hmm. So it, it can be correlated with autoimmune disease. Yeah, absolutely. And it's so fascinating. It's right. It's for anyone who's been diagnosed with an autoimmune condition, it's literally your immune system fighting against itself. And it does not make sense logically. If if we want to survive, our body should not, it doesn't, it's not reasonable for our body to be fighting against itself. So what is going on? It's fighting against something that has embedded. Maybe it's we're eating crap food and the body's like, I got to get this out. I mean, what stress is too high, but it sounds like mold is a big one. What a, a lot of, a lot of the women that are in my space, it's specifically around the world of really looking at hormones and hormone imbalances and, you know, cortisol is off the charts. Their dopamine's low. They're not producing progesterone. They're not ovulating. The HPA axis is off, um, which obviously goes back to gut health. And I'm imagining you can go, yep, there could be gold mold. Could you talk through any of that? So do you see any link with a woman who has been, let's say she's not producing testosterone or whatever it might be in her, her hormonal imbalance? Could that be linked to mold? Sure. Let's talk about the most common hormonal pattern of women that come into your and my practice. They've got, um, you know, depressed cortisol. They're in phase two, phase three adrenal fatigue. They mm -hmm. have low DHEA. They have low progesterone. They have low testosterone and their EQ ratio is off, right? Mm -hmm. Most common pattern. You and I see it all day long. Yeah. What happens is let's, you know, go to the DHEA and the cortisol. That over time, you have a chronic stressor like mold that's causing inflammation, it's causing fatigue, it's causing pain, your body naturally is going to ramp up cortisol production to try and dampen that, right? That goes on long enough, cortisol is going to fall. Right. Absolutely. And for those of you that are like, wait, what's DHEA? DHEA sure. is it's it comes from the adrenals. We think of it as an androgen. It's part of, of our fight, flight or freeze response, kind of sort of but it then converts to estrogen, to testosterone, and some into progesterone. It is vital. I did a whole episode on it. I think it's episode 12. It's worth listening to. And then cortisol is the same thing. It is our innate fight, flight, or freeze response versus our innate rest and digest. And so what I'm hearing Chris say is over time, we're under so much stress that we, we, we go down that pathway into phase two, phase three of adrenal exhaustion. And now the body is just like, I'm sorry, I got nothing. And it stops producing cortisol and DHEA. And so, okay. So then say again, how that can link to mold. Sure. Because that toxic exposure creates an inflammatory stress in the body. Yeah. It taxes that system, right? Because what's, what's cortisol? It's, everybody knows what cortisone is, right? You take cortisone for an inflammatory thing. A doctor might prescribe it or you might put cortisone on your skin if you have an inflammatory thing, it's very similar. Your body has this natural response to dampen inflammation. So mold or the infections or whatever it is, is creating this inflammation. The body's pumping out cortisol to try and, try and dampen it. And over time, it gets exhausted. It yeah. works too hard and it runs through those cortisol stores. So you'll see people show up in this phase two, phase three, sometimes phase four adrenal fatigue. And as you alluded to there, you don't then have any of that DHEA to go to progesterone and go to testosterone and go to estrogen. Mm -hmm. And so all of your sex hormones start to fall too. So when you hear someone that's exhausted, they have no libido, you know, some of their classic proliferative sex hormone functions are diminishing. Yep. That's also a tip off that there might be something inflammatory like mold. Yeah. And that's then that's not even to get into the piece where mold taxes the liver 
which is also the processor of the hormones, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're if you're overburdening your liver with this exogenous toxin, you can't have the proper estrogen ratio. So I see that all the time too in men and women. Right. Yeah. So then, okay. So someone will say, I don't think I have mold in my home. I mean, I see a little bit maybe in the bathroom on the wall, or I think about when I lived on the big Island on the Hilo side. Oh my gosh. I would go into my closet and the shoes on the bottom of the floor would just have like a layer of mold that would be, it was insane. Or I remember I had one of those bamboo steamers, you know, the stacked ones up on the top shelf in the kitchen. And one time I took it down and it just, had a whole film, a layer of mold. I'm thinking, oh, yeah. so that's obvious. Sure. Um, can you talk through if someone goes, okay, yes, I've seen mold in my house or no, I haven't seen mold in my house. Is that relevant? Is that part of this exploration? It is. And this is where there's some complexity to it. And I spent a lot of time talking with this with clients. And so the first thing we should think about is, you know, are you living in mold? or is mold living in you, or the combination of those two things. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say it in that way is that many people will have had a mold exposure a long time ago, that damp basement you lived in in college, or that apartment that had the gutter that leaked and drained down, or the basement that flooded, and they no longer live there. They live in a nice, clean house. Maybe they were part and parcel to the production of the home, and they recognize that there's been no leaks, there's no problems, and they go, I'm not living in mold now. There's no way I could be sick from mold. Well, that's not necessarily true. You can have had mold exposures, a single one, or multiple mold exposures over the years, where either you just got exposed to the mycotoxins, which are the secondary metabolites of mold, or the things that mold use to sort of carve out their niche in the world, they're the poisons to fight off other molds those poisons can get into our bodies and they can make us sick. And those mycotoxins are sticky. They don't like to leave. So you can have been exposed to mold in Hawaii and still have some mycotoxins in your body that are just getting recycled around. Or back at that old exposure, you could have gotten exposed to some spores of mold and then now you're colonized with the mold. And I see that very frequently with people. The mold is living in your sinuses or it's living in your gut. So all that is to say that you don't have to currently be living in mold to be mold sick. Mm, so either you're living in it or it's living in you. Oh my gosh, I have so many questions. Right. Okay, let's. can we talk about testing? First, sure. what are some of the tests that you order for patients? If there's someone who is still seeing kind of a more mainstream provider, sure. what are some tests that they can ask for from the, from the place of self-advocacy? And then also, what are some tests that we can do in our home environment to screen for mold? Sure. Let's talk about two cases, two recent cases. Mom calls me up maybe three months ago, distraught, little baby, I think maybe nine months old, head to toe eczema, hmm. seen seven dermatologists. Most of those dermatologists have told her that she is not um, using enough emollient on the skin. The skin is too dry and that eczema is hereditary. Mom <laughs> has lost her mind over this. This is on the telephone. This is not a new case. This is me just answering the phone call of a distraught mother and having a couple minute conversation with her. Based on the fact that the mom has cut out gluten, has cut out dairy, has cut everything out of the child's diet, and we sort of go through the other basic health parameter things that might be driving eczema and none of them are there. I say, you know what? This sounds like mold. It's at that point that I think the mom is going to hang up the phone because she's going, who's this crazy guy in Oregon telling me this is mold? So what we do is I say, before we go any further, before you schedule a visit with me, let's collect a sample of the child's urine and see if there's any mycotoxins in the urine, those toxins that I was just talking about. As you might guess, that child's urine came back off the charts for mycotoxins. <laughs> we came to find out that this home that they're living in actually has mold. They had no sense of it but there's mold in the home. Case number two, a friend of mine that I know just the other day, eczema, 12 years, seen many dermatologists. I'm putting cortisone on it all the time. I can't get it under control. I tried quitting beer. I tried quitting this. I tried everything. Story goes, I lived in Utah 12 years ago, and it started when I lived there. I asked a few more questions about the house. Oh yeah, maybe that house was musty. 
Well, we just got his urine mycotoxins test back two days ago, off the chart mycotoxins. Hmm. So that is to say that if we have a suspicion of mold in the person, what we start with is a urinary mycotoxin test. Yep. So we do, do you a have first a morning collection. Yes. Well, okay. there's a couple of companies that do it. The two that we use most routinely are Real Time Labs and Great Plains. Yeah. 99% of the time I open with Real Time Labs, but there are specific reasons why we would use Great Plains also. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be first catch in the morning with the first urination. First urination. Um, we usually use something provocative, either in a child or an adult, because as I stated earlier, mycotoxins are sticky. They don't like to leave the body. So we typically have to give some things or do some things to try and liberate them. So we get a, a you know, an accurate sample. And what do those things look like? Typically an adult will do a sauna the night before. Mm -hmm. And then we might use something else provocative in the days leading up to that test, some herbs or other supplements to get the body to start to dump the mycotoxins. So what, like charcoal or some psyllium husk? No, no, that would be the exact opposite of what you would want to do. If you gave charcoal or psyllium husk, you would accidentally lower the amount of mold that showed up in the sample. Hmm. We actually have people stop all binders before they take their test because can you see it? it will artificially lower the amount? Those substances actually bind mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then what would be an example of something other than a sauna? What is a supplement that someone is going to take that would release the mycotoxins in the urine? Well, I'm, I'm remiss to give people specifics around this just because this really should be under the direction of a practitioner, but typically yeah. we'll use something like glutathione. Okay. And the reason I'm remiss is that people that are mold sick can feel really bad if you give them too much glutathione or you give them too right. much stuff to liberate. So we really like to tailor it to each individual client right. because we, we really don't want to aggravate them and make them feel a lot worse. Okay. So they can call you and obviously have a consult if they're curious. Um, it can either you're living in it or it's living in you. And it sounds like it can lay dormant for a really long time. Best test is first urine in the morning, do something ahead of time that kind of releases it. That's a very personalized thing. Um, are there any other tests other than the urine that you find helpful? You know, unlike some other conditions, we don't have a ton of tests to diagnose mold, but there are some other ones that are useful to sort of fill out the rest of the picture. So once we see that someone has urinary mycotoxins, one of the other follow-up tests we not infrequently use is an organic acids test. Mm -hmm. And that can give us a clue. An organic acids test is another urine test that tells us a bunch of metabolites in the urine. And that can give us clues to what types of molds might be in the body and how likely you are to be colonized. It just helps flush out the picture of understanding uh, whether or not the person's got mold living in them or they're living in mold. Yeah. 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 Conventional blood tests like complete blood counts and comprehensive metabolic panels, they don't have a ton of utility in mold. And so that's okay. another reason why mold often gets missed is that most conventional doctors don't really get trained in or are aware of the tests that we use for mold. Yeah. Even organic acid yeah. tests, my guess is there are specific nuances because this is what you specialize in that you're able to see where, you know, I'm, I'm pretty darn familiar with that test. And could I say that I would point something out? I go, oh gosh, that feels super nuanced. Um, one other piece we'll sometimes use is we'll use some really sophisticated testing from um, some lab companies where we look to see if the body's making antibodies against mold too. Hmm. Is your immune system saying like, I'm attacking mold because mold's in the air. It's everywhere. If we swiped right. your office right there, you would find mold spores. Right. And so our immune systems really shouldn't be heightened in attacking mold. So sometimes we'll also look at it in that way to understand the degree of mold sensitivity and how long it's been going on and what's the likelihood it's living mm -hmm. inside of you. You know, I love yes. that you said this because this is a really important piece. Okay. This does not mean that you become paranoid and you're trying to combat all mold in your environment. The reality is we live around bacteria and viruses and mold probably all of us every day. That doesn't mean that we overdo it on antibiotics and antibacterial ointments and try to perpetually combat any bit of mold. Is that fair to say? 
It is, yes, in, in the broadest sense. And that's really what my book is about, The Virus and the Host. It really helps balance the picture of understanding how much of us really is viral and bacterial and fungal. And that if we're healthy and we're in balance, those things don't tend to bother us. It's when we get out of balance with other toxins that those things, viruses, bacteria, and fungi can cause problems. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there is a really small subset of the population. Once they get sick with mold, they kind of need to be uber careful, at least until they're out of it and they're healthier. And they are people that have to take cleaning and carefulness to another level, but that's not the average person. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that probably shows up with asthma, lung, lung stuff, allergies, skin stuff. Would that be the most common kind of acute response? Not necessarily in those chronic people. Let's say you had someone that's had multiple mold exposures over the year. They're heavily colonized in both the respiratory tract and their gut. They're essentially far down the road to degeneration. Those people can present with neurological symptoms when they get around mold. Hmm. They can have muscle twitching. They can have headaches. They can have deep fatigue. So once it gets to a certain place, uh, not the classic symptoms of upper respiratory stuff don't necessarily hold true. Okay. Makes me think like I'm so sensitive to fragrances. Oh my gosh. I took, I was in Salt Lake city last week and I took an Uber and I got in and they had those air freshener things. It's amazing. I get a headache within seconds. I had my clothing over my nose, my scarf over my nose. It's amazing how body my, how quickly my body is sensitive to that. And so I imagine someone with longstanding mold, it's a, it's a quick response and they know that there's some there, that there's mold around them. Often, often. Yeah. It's like their their limbic system got turned on, their fight or flight, and it's hard to turn off. It recognizes mm -hmm. it, it sees it. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's also a clue for me in an intake. If someone tells me I'm highly sensitive to fragrances, I'm highly sensitive to electromagnetic frequencies, that's one of the things in my brain that tips me off. I should investigate further about mold. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to see you. It's fun because we don't have, we don't ha have our own family. Like this is my favorite provider that we go see. We have a basic PCP that I don't ever listen. I don't particularly appreciate his approach. Sure. And on a personal note, I don't know if you know this about my 10 year old, but he struggled with chronic idiopathic urticaria for now about six years. So for those of you that don't know what that is, he has hives. He has hives almost daily. They're diffuse. We've seen homeopaths and functional medicine docs and uh, acupuncturists and dermatologists and allergists. And, you know, it's it, the fascinating thing is it's we've traveled all over. It doesn't change based on where we travel. We've done all the diet modification. The, the thing that is most successful has been acupuncture puncture and when we did a true true like no histamine diet but that is in my opinion impossible to maintain over time um and one of the things i've considered number one he was born in hawaii and lived there the first year of his life number two in their guest room which is now his bedroom i had a fish tank for years that would splash and the wall bubbled a little bit and that little spot i'm so curious it probably has mold behind and i've doused it with bleach and i've doused it with vinegar and then come to find out bleach is not what i was supposed to do and so okay i i'm uh, there's so much we could talk about there well, but Mariah, i'm i'm aware of this you know i i I know about this with your son because once I came to pick my son up from playing at your house and Michael, your husband, started to talk about it. And you will you can ask him the first thing out of my mouth that I said, has he ever been tested for mold? When right. I hear about a kiddo that's got chronic urticaria, that's absolutely. And I know your family. You guys eat impeccably. You, you're very conscious people. You're like, you know, the upper echelon of people that take care of their health. You're so incredibly aware of it. And this is one of the things that can slip by people, even like you guys. So believe me, I'm, I'm very consciously aware that that's probably what's been going on with your son. Right. And yeah. even a GI map. So on a stool test, would it have shown up there? So this is cool. So a GI map is a really sophisticated DNA test that we use all day long that looks for bacteria, some forms of fungus, viruses, inflammatory markers in the bowel. And it's a great test because you can do it in babies. You can do it in grown-ups. What you'll most typically see on a GI map in someone that's colonized with mold in the bowel is you'll see 
a lot of dysbiotic bacteria that's overgrown. Yeah. And his GI map was pretty normal. Mm. So maybe it's not existing in his bowel. It's existing somewhere else, but might be in his sinuses or he might just still be living in it. It might, you know, any time, and this will go into the discussion about how you test your home. Yeah. No water anywhere outside of a toilet, shower, or sink is appropriate in an indoor environment. You know, water that splashed somewhere, water underneath anything, that's never okay because there are mold spores everywhere and mold seeks a place to live. And so if you have a spore and you have water, you're going to grow some mold. So does that mean no diffusers? I'm thinking our sauna, our diffusers, our uh, fish tanks. What else? What other scenarios will people yeah, have? I'm not a like fan fountains, of fountains. Like yeah. you, you, Yep. I'm not a fan of diffusers and I'm not a fan of humidifiers. I can't tell you how many times I think people have created a moldy environment in their home with a humidifier. Hmm. Unless you live in an extremely dry place, humidifiers are a recipe for creating mold. Mm -hmm. And so I think you can have some of those things safely in your home. I think you can have a fish tank safely in your home if it's not splashing onto a wall or splashing onto a floor. But anytime water gets anywhere, that's a that's an immediate concern that that must be cleaned up immediately and completely. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I always say about mold is um, mold in a way is sort of an analogy for the things you don't want to look at in your life. And so if you don't want to take the time to go under that cabinet and flip that thing over and look at it, if you don't want to take the time to go in the bathroom and kind of dig behind the stuff and look what's there, mold will grow. If you don't want to look in your RV and you go, gosh, yeah, there was that leak up there, but everything seems fine. I don't want to dig into that wall. Mold's going to grow there. Right. I find people get sick from their cars, their RVs all the time from mold. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I <laughs> When I was in Hilo, I'll never forget. There was the, the back window had been left down and, it, you know, it rained all the time. I remember looking in the back the floor of the back seat and there was like grass growing on yes. the floor of the car. Oh yes. my gosh. And, you know, your analogy of taking an account of what are the things we're not willing to look at. I think it also speaks to a culture where we go, 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 burn the candle at both ends. Don't take pauses. We're perpetually putting out the fire that's in front of us. And I imagine there's people listening that mean well, and they intend to address that thing. They intend to look under the sink knowing that there had been that drip, drip leak. And we spend too much time moving and not resting and probably don't really acknowledge how much time we'd spend doing the Facebook and the Instagram scroll or how much time we spend just sitting watching screens and TV. And instead there's these things that we, in our lives, that we're choosing to not turn over and look at underneath, which then speaks to the stress that is underlying and probably feeds into the possibility of underlying mold. Yes, all yeah. those things are true. So testing, if someone wants to test their home, sure. um, my understanding is you can do like air spore tests, you can do wipe tests, but, for, but the experts that I've listened to all say that's not enough that there are people that you can hire in your area that like, this is what they specialize in. Um, can you talk through a little bit? How does someone find a person? How do they test for mold in their home? Sure. This is a tricky thing, kind of in the same way that it's tricky in testing in the body. And at the core, this goes back to the fact that um, most builders of homes don't really understand how to make homes mold safe. If you, wherever you live, if you drive around right now in the middle of the winter, you see construction going up outside. People don't stop building the homes in the winter. But if you've ever thought about that, you've got wood out there and insulation and things that get wet. Right. And then it is enclosed. And yes, do they put moisture meters on it to make sure that there's an, a, a certain you know, allowable amount of moisture? Sure. But we trap moisture in homes in ways that we never should. The way that homes are built now super airtight, then don't breathe. That's really not great for mold either. Mold grows in those places. So the point of saying this is that, you know, a, a, the way to find mold is difficult. 
you really need someone that thinks like a nature path thinks in investigating all the different possibilities to find mold in your home. Because a lot of mold inspectors were contractors. They build homes and then they decided they wanted to get into, you know, um, remediation or mold investigation because it can be quite lucrative. You can help people. It's sort of a side business. You don't have to swing a hammer anymore. And so a lot of contractors who aren't, re who don't really understand how a home should be built to be safe from mold are then the ones that are inspecting for mold. Mm -hmm. And so a good mold inspector should take a very thorough history. They should come into your home and they should ask lots of questions. They should say, has there ever been any water intrusion anywhere? Have there ever been any leaks anywhere? Have you ever smelled anything anywhere? What do you know about the history of the home? When was the roof replaced? You know, they, they really should go through every system like a naturopath would in the body and see if they can deduce anything. And then they should go looking. They should crawl under the house. They should go up into the attic. They should investigate behind everything they can, and they should really do a good visual inspection to understand and see if they can see any clues. Because often mold is in walls and mold is in floors and mold is behind things and you can't necessarily see it. So they need to do that second step. Then there's two layers of testing that branch off of there and they're the ones that you alluded to. So the one, the Swiffer test is called an ERMI test. And this was a test that was developed actually by the US government to determine the relative moldiness of areas. And what this is, is that the mold inspector or the client uh, essentially takes a Swiffer cloth and goes along and Swiffers in a certain amount of square footage on the tops of things, the tops of dressers, the tops of bookshelves, the tops of door jams, the places where dust and mold falls. And you send that Swiffer test off, it comes back with a result that tells you the amount and types of mold species that are there. Now, as we said earlier, I could Swiffer your office right now and I would find some mold DNA because mold floats in from the outdoors. If the windows or doors have ever been open, there's some mold spores in there. But what's interesting about an ERMI test is the types of molds that are there. If we have a huge preponderance of molds that are molds we know grow indoors on, let's say, drywall, that tips you off, you know? If there's a whole lot of molds that aren't typical outdoor air molds, that tips you off. Mm -hmm. And then if there's a lot of them, if you go, gosh, you know, like I know Maria, she seems really put together. She keeps a clean home. And I just tested her office and boy, there's a lot of mold in here. That should be a tip off too. So a good mold inspector will do that and look at that with a discerning eye. Now, the problem is a lot of mold inspectors, conventional mold inspectors, they discredit the ERMI test. They say it doesn't mean anything and they don't use it. Hmm. And they say that back to the point that, well, there is mold everywhere. But I think I just explained why that test is important. It mm -hmm. can give us a clue. Now, a conventional mold inspector, what they mostly do is they use a, a little device and they, they set it up in rooms throughout your home or wherever they're testing. And then they set one up outside and they, it's called a spore counter. And they look for the number of spores of mold that pass through this device in a certain allotted amount of time. That gives you a count and it also tells you what types of molds are there. A spore count's important too, but a spore count will not catch mold that is inside of a wall. Mm -hmm. It will not catch mold that's inside of a floor. It will not catch mold that's not currently pumping out lots of spores, but instead dormant mold or mold that is not living exteriorly on a surface. Unfortunately, mold that is inside of a wall or under a floor can also make people sick. People that are sensitive to mold will absolutely be sick in a home where there is mold and there are negative spore counts. So I've also seen many, many, many times people that go, I know my home is moldy. I just know it. They have a mold inspector come out who doesn't really take a good history, doesn't really poke around very much and does a spore count and gives them a clean bill of health. Mm -hmm. And I've had hundreds of those patients who are still sick from their homes. So as you can see, this starts to get quite complex. It's not yeah. an easy equation. It's not just like do this, do this, do that. Well, and it also has the potential to get very expensive. So what you 
build a new house, you move. I mean, I listened to a Gwyneth Paltrow podcast on Goop where she had a remediator come and literally did a complete remodel, gutted her entire bathroom, redid it. Um, and it made it all the difference for her. She started feeling better. And yes. cha-ching for a lot of people. Yes. Yes. It can be yep. quite a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Quite a lot of money. And so that's difficult. This is, I have these conversations with people every day, you know, trying to understand how to navigate potentially an office or a home where they think they might be getting sick from mold. Yeah. Yep. So if, if you've diagnosed someone with uh, an overgrowth of mold or their body's sensitivity to mold and um, you've decided either it exists in them or they're living in it. What are some of like your top three? Here are the starting points of what someone can do. And this leads into where I, you know, because that last piece can leave people feeling kind of desperate going, well, I just listened to this expert about mold talk. And he says, right. it's really challenging to find it in my home. And what I'll say is that the way we approach this is if someone is very sick from mold, they've had a positive mycotoxin test, they have classic symptoms of mold, and we're not sure. I don't know if their home has mold because they had the mold inspector out. They didn't get a positive spore count and we just don't know. We start treating them. Mm -hmm. And if we treat them and they get better and their mold scores go down, well, they're probably not living in mold. But if we treat them and they don't get better and we give a reasonable amount of time and a reasonable amount of time in mold is long. Mold treatment takes a long time. Like if years, we, months, weeks? I usually tell people it's going to take at least two years. Wow. Sometimes longer. Yes, it's unfortunately one of the illnesses that takes the longest to get better from. Mm -hmm. But that being said, people can feel so much better. And so right. many of their other diseases and conditions often go away when you deal with the mold because it's a fundamental root cause problem. Right. So if I've treated someone for nine months or a year and they're just not getting better, that's a huge tip off to me that they're still in mold. They're right. working in mold or they're living in mold. And so that's often the decision point where people go, okay, now I am going to dig into that wall. I'm going to spend that money or I'm going to get out. Mm -hmm. And so if we're making the assumption, we just start by treating, what are some of the starting points? I mean, obviously you are not, whoever's listening, Dr. Lebowski is not your provider. This is a personalized thing. This does not mean you just go out willy nilly and make an assumption and go add in a shelf of supplements, definitely you want to be tested and find someone. But in your practice, what are some of your top three go-tos to actually start treating the mold? Sure. And it's very specific to each client and it's very nuanced, the whole thing. It honestly is. Um, and the biggest thing is because in mold illness, you don't want to push through anything. Mm -hmm. If you're taking something and it's making you feel worse, in the long run, that will only cause more harm and it will only take more time. That's the other reason why mold illness takes a long time to get over is we do it very slow and very gentle. We mm -hmm. don't expect any kind of Herxheimer reactions. We really don't want a flare of symptoms at all because it will only trigger your limbic system more to be in fight or flight you will feel worse, you will have more inflammation, and it will take longer. Mm -hmm. With all that being said, if we know that someone has mold illness, we have a documented mycotoxins in their urine, we're unsure about the home, one of the first things we do is we start to dampen the histamine. Because mm -hmm. histamine is you know, something that gets released by our mast cells in our body, as well as 99 other things. But histamine is what causes those urticarial rashes. It's what causes the itching. It's what causes the symptoms after eating. And so we start using natural compounds to dampen the histamine and some combination of drugs too. Sometimes I'll use over-the-counter medications or prescription medications, though we'll often start with- um, Like an Allegra or a Claritin? Like yeah, like yep. Okay. Yeah. So for those of you, he said urticaria a couple of times. That's just hives. Just yes, to, thank you. For those, yeah. Okay, so dampen the histamine potentially with yep. herbs, supplements, maybe even a Benadryl, Allegra, Claritin, Zyrtec, taking that route potentially. Yep, and sometimes we'll use uh, specific medications too, chromium sodium, chromalin sodium or catodafin. There's a lot of different things just based on the way the person's presenting with histamine. Mm -hmm. And the whole reason to do that is just sort of like calm the system down. Right. Get everything dampened. And usually... <clears throat> 
the client will feel a little bit better. You know, yeah. they'll feel, they'll go, oh yeah, those histamine symptoms are better, which is nice. They still will have huge other mold symptoms, but it, it brings it down. And it, the way I think about it is it puts a little of the fire out because one of the things about mold and other chronic infections and toxicities is that when we're super toxic and inflamed, it actually makes it even harder for our body to detoxify. Mm -hmm. Inflammation shuts down the ability to detoxify. So if I can shut it down a little bit and calm it, it will often make the treatment go smoother and faster. So one, we start dampening the histamine. Once that's on board and things are going well, then two, we start binding the mycotoxins in the body. That's when we start to use more classic binders to grab the mycotoxins and mop them up. And that's back to your comment earlier about activated charcoal. That's one of the binders that we use. Mm -hmm. We use clays and we use chlorella and we even use some medications, but very specifically in a very specific dosages based on the person's mycotoxin scores. Right. So, so this is where it gets can, really nuanced. So someone might go, oh, I'm going to go try bentonite clay. I'm going to go try some chlorella, but it sounds like, you know, it's the same with any toxin. You can trap it, you can dislodge it from its current home, but has it just moved to another area of the body or is it roaming around wreaking more havoc? Or do we have a clear pathway to dislodge it from its current home and get it out of the body? Yes. And it sounds like that's a very nuanced and very personalized thing. It is, and it, and it also requires consistency, which is hard for clients who weren't aren't working under the direction of someone because they might do it for three months and feel really bad and not really recognize what's happening because it's hard to see things in ourself. Mm -hmm. And so I do always like to empower people. I do this with my book, and I, I like people to take things away when I speak in podcasts to do on their own, you know, because there's only so many of you and I to treat clients. Mm -hmm. um, and that being said, with mold illness, particularly if it's still living inside of you or you're living in it, it's very difficult to do it carefully and not make things worse. I happened to meet a guy the other day who was a remediator. He rips into walls and pulls out mold and he told me some things. You know, we, we weren't even really talking about it. He goes, gosh, you're a doctor. You know, I've been getting these bloody noses. This is like a 50-year-old guy. I go, have you ever gotten bloody noses before? He goes, no, I'm getting bloody noses. I said, that's mold illness. If I hear someone that's starting to get bloody noses, they've never gotten them before. To me, that's mold illness until proven otherwise. He's getting aching pains in his body. He goes, God, I have to go to the massage therapist every week. I didn't have to do this. I didn't used to have to do it. To him, I said, start taking some activated charcoal at night. You know, like I'm not convinced that he has mold growing inside his body yet, but just that he's working around mold and ripping mold out. And so I'm having him take a couple capsules of activated charcoal at night just in the hopes to bind up some of those mycotoxins and move them out of the body. Right. And then make sure that he's having regular bowel movements and peeing and sweating on a regular basis. Absolutely. So that's a whole nother piece. So, you know, the, the, to assist our detoxification, one of the best things we can do to get mycotoxins out of our body, one, like you just said, Maria, is one, you have to be pooping. If you're not pooping on a regular basis and you're liberating toxins and then they just sit in your bowel, they will just become reabsorbed. So we always make sure the patient's primary amunctories, which is a term that says the places where we release from the body, our primary amunctories are open and working first. Right. Our kidneys are working, our liver's working, our bowels are working. If those aren't working, we have to get all that stuff in line first before we start giving binders and mobilizing toxins. Mm -hmm. yep. And probably assisting with methylation. So I'm, I'm making the assumption that the glutathione probably continues, maybe some methylated B complex really going in and supporting all the different ways that someone can detox, but this is a long route. So for someone who's listening and feeling like, oh my gosh, this is probably me. And I feel a little overwhelmed and discouraged <laughs> because it is, you know, it sounds like quite an endeavor to get it out. The endeavor is worth it because they feel spectacular on the other end. Yes. But do you have any words of wisdom to just make it feel um, a little bit less heavy for someone who's ready to take a step? Sure. The thing I can say about it is that you can get out of this. You can feel better with mold. And it's one of those things where people have been sick for so long and they can be so confused and not really sure of the diagnosis that once you, you hit on this and it's the right one, you can steadily climb out of that hole. 
And I see that every single day with clients and it's a wonderful thing. So if you've been sort of lost in the wilderness of your illness and some of these things are starting to ring a bell and they're starting to sound like this might be you, there's hope because mm-hmm. you can get out of it. And what I would say is, you know, we don't have um, necessarily good organizations for people that are trained in mold. Uh, there have been some over the years, but there isn't one where I could say, go to this website and these people certainly know what they're doing, but go out and hunt for a protect- practitioner and listen to the words I said through this thing. And if they're talking in similar terms and it, it's sounding like this, then they probably know what they're talking about. Yeah, that feels great. And also along the journey, what do you have to lose? You're still going to be decreasing your inflammation. You're still going to be st- focusing on stress reduction, which is then going to help you sleep better and decrease aging and probably make your mood feel more stable and you're going to be more present and you'll have more brain clarity and you'll be able to do the work that you're wanting to do and be more present in the life that you're living. I mean, all of it, I'm guessing, no matter how long it takes to eradicate the mold, there's probably still going to be great side effects that are positive from the steps that someone is taking along the journey. Yes. Yes. Yeah. People along the way, symptoms fall away. Yeah. They go, that thing that I had forever, now that's gone. That thing right. is gone. And right. even though they may not be 100% well for a long period of time, other things do go away. So there is great benefit in yeah. removing the mold from your system. I always say it's like the light bulb turns on. You didn't realize you've been kind of living in a dark room and then someone turns the lights on and you're like, oh, wow. I can see. okay just a few minutes left do you want to say anything else about your book any last parting words that feel unsaid from the conversation we've had i mean i've taken a lot of notes there's so much here i think it's time for me to bring kaimana in to come see you um anything else you want to add there i really jam-packed this 290 page book with a lot of information that's super useful for people There's a lot of stuff in my book, The Virus and the Host, about mold. There's a lot of uh, mention of different treatments in there. And so for the, you know, whatever it costs online, the $23 you might pay for that book, I really wanted it to be a great value for people. And the, the first half of it is sort of my story and ideas around why I think people got so sick from COVID, and that ties into mold and toxicity. And the second half of that book is really a reference manual that I hope people read the first half and then they put it on the shelf and then they pull it out over the years and go back through the second half because I do outline a lot of treatments, a lot of supplements, a lot of herbs that I really wanted people to um, be able to use over Mm -hmm. and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Is there going to be an audio version of the book? There already is. Oh, there is. Okay. So there's Amazon and get the audio version. It's available on Amazon. It's available at the publisher, chelseagreen.com. It's available on bookstore.org. Great, great. So if, you know, obviously there's lots of action steps you can take moving forward. Um, Dr. Lebowski's contact information and website is there in the show notes. Reach out to him, buy the book, um, maybe start exploring just self-evaluation and really get honest with yourself. Are any of these symptoms really there? And, you know, maybe you can advocate for your provider to do a urine mycology test, right? Is that what it was? Mycotoxin test. Urine mycotoxin test. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, maybe. Look, I always say flip over the rocks. Look Look in the places you haven't looked. Yep. Yep. So thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I know you're you're maintaining and running a very robust practice and you have a full personal life. So I thank you for your time and for everyone that's listened into this. I thank you for your time. You're obviously taking your well-being seriously. And I know that we all live productive lives. And so I honor all of us for sharing this hour that we shared together. And I feel grateful. So with that, thank you, Chris. I really do appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Mm-hmm.